as you all know, soft tissue is very important, especially for long term of success of the implants. Every time we don't have the correct volume or the correct uh, keratinization, we can have uh, problems of uh, cleaning for the patient, or we can have even biological complications, or we can have aesthetic complications. So. Uh, what we want to obtain always at the end is a natural uh, keratinization and a natural volume for the soft tissue. We have the kinetic tissue that is, of course, our gold standard. We have all fantastic features of the connective tissue, especially when we want to obtain keratinization and proliferation. But we have also an alternative that is the porcine dermis matrix. Uh, we have a lot of good future features. Uh, we have big quantities that we don't have with uh, autologous connective tissue, and it's not so uh, invasive uh, like taking connective tissue. Of course, connective tissue is the most predictable solution when the patient uh, can receive this kind of intervention. You see how the proliferation works. We start with this situation and without any bone grafting, we obtain such a big volume of soft tissue. Or this case that was made by my friend Eugenio Longo, uh, we started with this situation of very, very dramatic uh, problem with the soft tissue and just using soft tissue obtain this shape for uh, the restoration. The implant is not yet uh, placed. Probably we will not use an implant in this case, but we obtain an ideal shape of the soft tissue. Uh, this is not probably uh, yet possible with biomaterials. We need the connective tissue from the patient. But the porcine dermis matrix works brilliantly when we need a protection, when we need volume, uh, we can even use as a membrane, as you have seen before. Uh, we have a rapid revascularization and integration, and this is fantastic, is very effective, is very easy in the hands of everybody. We have the complete remodeling into the patient on tissue, and the resorption is about six to nine months, can be easily shaped, applied, and fixed. And how we use in our daily practice, in cases like this where the tissue is not bad, the tissue is still possible to do without an increase of keratinization. I just want to have a little increase in volume, so I insert one slice, I insert my healing abutment so I don't have to disturb the tissue again. And we finalize the case. If you want a little more, you can bend it. You can use uh, the same uh, porcine dermis matrix, but you use not in a single layer. You bend it to have a sort of sausage that you will insert under the soft tissue and you can close leaving a little, a little uh, empty space, not the primary closure, because we want to get more keratinization. You see a good case with good keratinization. We are only missing some volume. We can graph with the hard tissue, why not? But uh, if you can use a narrow implants, like in this case, we use a 3.3 millimeter implant that stay completely into the bone. It's sufficient to insert a little slice of mucoderm and we obtain, you see, a good amount of volume with a very low risk uh, in this case, because this material is very difficult to get infected. It's very stable in time. So we obtain a very good quantity of volume uh, if the keratinization is still okay. Uh, a way to stabilize, this is not an implant case, of course, but uh, a way that I like very much for stabilization is to use sutures to the, peri uh, to the periosteum. 
So we come from the pellet, we, we, we take the periosteum tissue and we go back to the pellet. So we are free to move the mucoderm in the correct position. We can also do with implants. There's another possibility to mix the mucoderm with emtogain. Uh, is a quite expensive solution, I could say. Uh, we tested for a paper that is uh, in, present, in, uh, in preparation. The study was already done. Uh, we have some scientific base for this combination because the emtogain is able to stay on the membranes and this was the study that I did with Luca Bonino and Nicola De Angelis to use tissue level implants with mucoderm emtogain in a single stage, uh, no bone graft, single layer of, uh, of mucoderm, not a double layer, single layer. And we uh, evaluated the volume with uh, computer uh, programs. The technique was very simple, a single layer uh, healing abutment and measure of the volume. This how we studied the changes in volume and we had uh, some results very, very good with uh, improvements of around one millimeter and a half in volume. In some cases, we obtain even impressive increase. We don't know why. In some cases, we obtain even seven millimeters of volume more, like in this case, that was very, very uh, impressive for me. Uh, the, the paper is in preparation, not yet in publication, but I hope we will publish soon. Uh, you can see another case with uh, no volume in the posterior area of the mandible. Um, we provide for rehydration of the mucoderm that is very, very rigid. And rehydration was made with emdogain primarily to leave emdogain to enter inside the mucoderm. And emdogain is not enough for rehydration, so we need few drops of saline solution to have the highest percentage of emdogain during the rehydration. The technique was to use few drops. You see we have a progressive rehydration with the minimum quantity of saline solution. And this is no bone grafting, only grafting with emdogain and mucoderm. We had after 12 weeks with a temporary uh, good situation. This is how we started and this is how we finish just taking care about the soft tissue. Uh, another application of biomaterial during our long journey into the biomaterial applications is at the moment of extraction. There are many, many uh, papers who uh, demonstrated what happens during the healing period after tooth extractions. Uh, we have, in most of cases, a resorption of the buccal plate uh, vertically and horizontally. And unfortunately, the implant placement is not sufficient to maintain bone. Again, when I started in the half of the 90s, the main idea was place an implant after one extraction so the bone will not resorb. And this idea that we had was not correct because we all know that resorption occur anyway, even if we place an implant. And resorption is more and more severe as more thin is the buccal plate. So when you have less than one millimeter in the buccal plate before the extraction, you have a resorption that is 3.5 greater than in case of thick bone in the buccal plate. And unfortunately, most of anterior area has less than one millimeter of bone. And this bone is uh, we call bundle bone that is related to the periodontal ligament is not basal bone. 
So when you remove the tooth, you remove the periodontal ligament, you sacrifice the vascularization, and you have a natural resorption of this buccal plate. And uh, since many years, people try to uh, maintain this bone using what we call ridge preservation, alveolar ridge preservation. And uh, we have some data who show that this technique are, is quite effective to maintain uh, the bone better than a natural uh, healing. And what we normally uh, observe in systematic review and meta-analysis of this technique is that we can obtain two millimeters of maintenance more instead of a natural uh, of a natural uh, healing of the socket. But uh, this technique is not free of problems, is not free of complications, because we all know that as you graft with biomaterials, you have to wait up to six months. Uh, in the next days, you will see tomorrow, I think you will see uh, my friend uh, uh, Al Alfredo, uh, that will show how we can uh, use different techniques to preserve bone after extraction. And uh, looking at the literature, we observe that uh, using this technique, we can maintain a little better the situation of bone. Uh, we have even different options, not only the alveolar ridge preservation, we can even decide to take care just of the stabilization of the blood clot without using biomaterial and wait less time. Instead of six months, we can wait six, eight weeks and go back for a GBR technique. Or we can wait a longer time with the natural uh, healing and uh, taking care of the volume with a new GBR technique or doing an alveolar ridge preservation. So we have different options, uh, spontaneous healing, socket filling without the membrane or a complete alveolar ridge preservation. And we can perform all these techniques using autologous bone, homologous bone, heterologous bone or synthetic. We will see some cases with different techniques. Uh, we have different options and we don't have a good option and a bad option. We have different cases with different opportunities of treatment. Uh, let's go a little faster, sorry. Okay, sometimes I could say many times I prefer a spontaneous healing after extraction to do not a, an alveolar ridge preservation. Let's see, for example, in which indication I like to do. For example, when my extraction is in case of an acute infection or an active periodontitis, or when the, the bone feeling is already spontaneous, very predictable, or when I want to go back fast. I don't want to wait six months. I want to go back after six, eight weeks and do uh, my treatment with a better situation. Let's see, for example, this case. This is a patient with a, a serious problem of periodontitis. We have many questionable teeth in this mouth. So, if I decide to take out this tooth, for example, only, and not to take out all the neighbor teeth, I don't feel uh, okay, I don't feel comfortable to use a GBR technique in this case because I have contamination. Some teeth are still questionable. So it's uh, too risky to use biomaterials in this situation even if I had to do an extraction. So we will do an extraction and my friend Eugenio Longo will take care about the periodontal treatment in this patient with different treatments. And we simply wait. I'm sorry for this temporary is very bad. <laughs> anyway, 
I simply wait. I did nothing in this case, simply spontaneous healing. Uh, we decided to wait longer because we wanted to control the patient if she was uh, a good patient for implants uh, as she's coming from a periodontal problem. So we decided to graft with soft tissue, with mucoderm, just to improve the situation. And you see, after that, we decided to place one implant after around one year, placing one narrow implant and again grafting with mucoderm to improve the volume. And you see how we started and how we finished only with soft tissue grafting and waiting a normal healing after infection using mucoderm and using endogen in this case. We started from this situation, we kept the neighbor tooth, we extracted only that incisor and waited a, a normal healing, taking care about the infection, taking care about the periodontal problem and waited a longer time without doing big things. This is after one year, the control that is still stable. In other cases, I like to use the porcine dermis matrix for stabilization. You see, I have a good predictable defect. I have a lot of bone. I don't feel very risky to leave a spontaneous healing. I just want to stabilize the blood clot, so I leave exposed the mucoderm. I uh, wait for a, a healing and when the bone is healed, I can place a standard, a wide implant, in this case, a, a wide neck implant. Again, stabilization, waiting for a normal healing of the bone, just with a blood clot. After a couple of months, two, three months are sufficient in this area. And we place an implant and the finalization of the case. Another case, you see the technique. I normally try to insert the mucoderm after extraction, after removal of granulation tissue. I want to stabilize the blood clot. So we don't want to use biomaterials in this situation. So I designed the mucoderm as a surf, as a surfboard to get inside the, the periosteal tissue, stabilized with two stitches, and when more stitches to keep in place, and you see then the normal healing and the implant placement after three months and the finalization of the prosthesis. In some other cases, I prefer to use this technique using also bone fillers because in some cases where the defects are bigger, I especially like this technique for second lower molars where the uh, formation of bone is very slow and sometimes not very predictable or in the upper canine where the defects sometimes are huge uh, for spontaneous healing. So, for example, in this case, I have a very old fracture in this molar. I decided to use Max Resorb that it goes away after three, four months. I uh, use mucoderms and I used in this case a collagen sponge, Jason fleece on top to, uh, to obstacle, to, 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 um, to give more time for resorption of the mucoderm. This was the healing after one week. Looks not very nice, but in reality, inside is working. This is after six months when I decided to place an implant. And this is the final outcome with a good maintenance of volume and uh, a good uh, final outcome. In some other cases, we need to do the most complex uh, solution with biomaterials and a membrane. And this we do 
uh, when we have major defects and we don't want to have the soft tissue invasion and sometimes we do for pontics for example when we want to exclude the possibility to place an implant or for lower second molars again or upper canines we have two possibilities one to use membrane or matrix or even to use the epithelial connective by uh, epithelial connective tissue from the pellet uh, we have some good sides and some good bad sides for both techniques uh, I think that the epithelial connective tissue is useful only if you if your skill with this uh, technique is very very high because we have many risk of necrosis and uh, sometimes is quite invasive uh, this case again from my office with uh, Dr. Eugenio Longo used again in case of anterior case to get some proliferation together with some bovine bone and you can see how the soft tissue grafting the the soft tissue grafting from the pellet is not passive is active it proliferates uh, you can get more keratinization and this was at the moment of implant insertion you see we have an ideal amount of bone and an ideal soft tissue anatomy to receive one implant so to use uh, again the connective tissue is a possibility when you want to improve all the situation not just the bone uh, you can do uh, together with the bone to obtain the ideal condition for implant placement after six months. We have another possibility that sometimes is very interesting to me uh, when, for example, we want to avoid the loosening of keratinized tissue. We don't want to have, we don't want to lose the keratinized tissue that is present. Let's see, for example, this case uh, we have two failing molars, but we don't want to have a primary closure because we don't want to lose the keratinized tissue. So a possibility is to use uh, this sort of barrier that is not resorbable, that is called permamem, that will stay around one month uh, to protect the blood clot formation. In this case, what's placed on top of bovine bone we see after one month one month and a half i don't remember i decided to remove it because it was not exactly stable under that barrier the soft tissue looked uh, still a little bleeding but you can see that we could maintain some bone and to have a crystal sinus augmentation in this case to place a single BLT implant with a, a very favorable condition of soft tissue around so this option I think is very useful when you don't want to have a primary closure you want to wait in a posterior area a spontaneous healing of the area let's see for example one one case very interesting i think because this young patient uh, had at the same time the indication for extraction of the two lower molars uh, at the same time this is not very common and we decided to do two different techniques in one side i decided to do an alveolar ridge preservation and you see i had a partial failure of that procedure after seven days i had an exposure of the bovine bone sorry of the max resorb the the and you see even with this partial exposure after six months the anatomy was very very maintained so i could with a very simple uh, incision to insert a wide neck implant in this area 
after six months. On the other side, I left a spontaneous healing without bone grafting, without anything, just spontaneous healing. And you see how after six months, we have this concavity. So we need a bigger intervention, not so big, but we need to elevate a bigger flap to insert the implant and again to treat the concavity with um, cerebone, so bovine bone and mucoderm to obtain a convexity instead of a concavity. So the same case, the same patient on the left side, she had an initial bigger intervention and a second very, very mild intervention. On the other side, in the same patient, we had a very simple extraction with no bone grafting, but we need bone grafting at the moment of implant insertion. This is just to say that uh, it's very difficult to do without grafting nowadays. Another possibility is the immediate implant insertion from ITI. We all know that we have some little advantages to place immediately the implant. We have a reduced number of surgical procedure. We have a reduced overall treatment time, but we have also many, many disadvantages. For example, the side morphology may complicate the optical placement and anchorage of the implant. We can have a lack of soft tissue, a potential risk of lack of keratinized mucosa, and many times we have to uh, graft in this case, I could say in most of cases. And the requirements for this technique is to insert the implant prosthetically driven, not driven by the socket, but driven by the processes. We need to reach a sufficient primary stability that is not always easy to get. We have to consider that after implant placement, we will have some remodeling in bone, some resorption, especially in the buccal plate. And we have to take care about the soft tissue, like always, and to consider a higher risk by in a biologic point of view. And that most of time we have to graft because we have some jumping distances between the threads of the implant and the walls of the socket. The survival rate of immediate implants is quite good. It's only 3% less good than the, the, the light implants. And we can have uh, very often the need of biomaterial when we have more than one millimeter of jumping distance. Let's see, for example, this case. I extracted one premolar. I decided to place one BLX implant that is very, very easy for get high primary stability. And I decided to use a sim very simple device that is a healing abutment that goes inside a little disc of mucoderm. You see the mucoderm seals exactly the socket. I don't need any suture in this case. This is not very common. This is the healing in time and the quality of the soft, soft tissue that we get. We can see more in details. Very, very simple technique. We close all the empty spaces, so we expect that the blood clot works for us. And this is the final quality of the soft tissue and the prosthesis and the final X-ray. Uh, another possibility where we have more uh, jumping distance. This was the situation. At the moment of implant insertion, we have this empty space that is too big for just wait for a spontaneous healing. We have 
too much distance between the implant and the bone. So we risk an invasion of the soft tissue in this case. So what we can do is to graft with bovine bone in this case, or we can use synthetic. Anyway, it's better to fill this empty space. And then we can, even in this case, protect with porcine dermis matrix. So we will fill with bovine. Magnification is very important when you don't elevate the flap. I like to use the microscope every time I don't, I cannot, I don't want to elevate the flap. I have to control from inside. So I need magnification and illumination. And after, after that, again, we can seal with this very simple disc of mucoderm. We try to keep the mucoderm as more as possible inside, not too much exposed. You see, after that, I try to keep inside. I don't have, I don't want to have big, big exposure of the material and as the material is so elastic, I like sometimes to use sutures to stabilize it in the proper way. This is what I did using a couple of stitches just to keep the mucoderm in place. This is the healing after one week. and the final situation and the soft tissue at the moment of crown delivery. Sorry, I go a little faster here because it's too long, this video. Okay, another case, very, very interesting for me, was that one, a very young patient, she, he, he fell and broke two uh, perfect teeth uh, with no any any pathology just because of a trauma. He had these two horizontal fractures in the roots and unfortunately I was obliged to remove these roots because the line of fracture was very, very uh, below, under the, the, the bone level. So I took out, I inserted two implants. There was a remaining distance that was a little too much for spontaneous feel, uh, feeling, so I used bovine bone and again dermis matrix, and this is the closure with the healing abutment, and this is the final delivery of the crowns with a very good healing of the bone and the soft tissue. Uh, Go a little faster here because I think otherwise we have no time to see all the cases. Yeah, let's move to something that probably is more attractive for some of you, that is the management of anterior cases. Uh, our Moses <laughs> for these anterior cases is the laws of our anterior cases is in ITI treatment guide, uh, volume 10, where you find these very, very useful principles to understand if the risk, risk is low, is medium, or is high. So all the cases I will show you uh, will be uh, together with this guide. And as you saw before, even when we talk in post-extraction, we have to respect all the rules. And very often we have to prepare, not in the center of the socket, like in this case, but a little posteriorly to give space for uh, biomaterials to maintain the volume between the buccal plate. This is unfortunately not always possible. Remember that we have some cases where we have no bone, 
behind. So when we face an anterior case, when we want to do a fresh socket implant, uh, CBCT uh, is very, very important to detect if we have the possibility to insert an implant a little bit more posteriorly. And uh, we have in these cases, in these anterior cases, more risk of complication uh, for example, we can uh, we have a an aesthetic risk in case of resorption of uh, anti the buccal plate. Uh, we have, uh, for example, in this paper, uh, a buccal recession in around eleven percent of cases that is not acceptable. For example, for my clinic, I think if I have eleven percent of aesthetic problems in anterior case, I would be always be with a lawyer uh, close to me. So I cannot accept this kind of risk. I have to uh, plan the cases in the right way. And planning is a key factor always, but especially when we work in anterior cases. For example, I will show you this case that we saw in my office, this female was uh, 17 years old. She had a traumatic fracture of a central incisor that is the main uh, aesthetic uh, region of the mouth. And the colleague, uh, one colleague in my region decided to make a post-extraction implant at the age of 11 years old. And when we saw this patient, she was very upset. She was very stressed because she wear for two years one removable temporization because the colleague was not convinced to proceed with the processes with this implant. And the situation, as you can see, is very, very unpredictable. Dr. Eugenie Longo took care of this patient and we evaluated this implant, but in our hands, this implant was hopeless and we decided to proceed to extract this implant because uh, in this case, in our uh, idea, our point of view was that it was not uh, predictable to leave this implant. So we decided to uh, graft to, and this case was published in an aesthetic review, an international aesthetic review was performed without an implant with a, a simple Maryland bridge after soft tissue grafting. But it was just to show that if you, if you make the wrong planning, you make everything wrong. And immediate restoration implants uh, is indicated for many reasons. Uh, in reality, most of the re these reasons are not important. Um, for example, decrease the number of the surgery is not the biggest problem. Decrease the time of treatment is not a big problem. Psychology of the patient is not so big because when you have a failure like before, the psychology of the patient is worse with an implant than without an implant. Uh, but the main reason that I consider is to maintain the soft tissue architecture in this patient. Uh, we have many disadvantages. We increase the complexity. We have a frequent grafting techniques. We increase the early failure risk. We need a, a high stability to try to have an immediate restoration. And we need skill and experience of the clinician. Let's see, for example, this case. This is very favorable. We have a fracture of one central incisor. The fracture is below the line of bone, so I prefer to uh, treat this case with uh, an immediate implant, a uh, filling of the empty space between the buccal plate and the implant. And if I have enough primary stability, I can use uh, a temporary that is made of composite and I deliver the same moment of implant insertion. Again, I use mucoderm as, uh, as a very good device to seal the space between the temporary and the internal side. 
This is the healing after also integration. And this is the final crown that was delivered with the X-ray. The decisional tree, if it's possible to do a, an immediate placement and immediate restoration in the anterior region, I need four conditions. I need to get a high primary stability. I need to exclude patients with big lateral forces like deep bite. I need a good compliance of the patient. The patient have to understand that we are doing something that is risky, so he has to exclude some food or some, uh, some forces on this temporary. And I want to have a good condition in hard and soft tissue. When all the four conditions are respected, I can do an immediate restoration. In case that, for example, I have a deep bite or I don't trust so much in how the patient will treat my implant, I can switch to a very, very good solution that is the customized healing abutment. Or in case that other conditions are not respected, I can uh, stage the implant or I can submerge the implant if I want to do at the same time. Let's see, for example, when I say about the compliance of the patient, it was, was a patient I did this temporary and the patient came back with a broken temporary. So the implant was not uh, integrated yet and the patient already broke the temporary. I don't know in South America, in Italy, when they break one temporary, they always say that did it with broth or something very soft. I don't know if even in Latin American people say the same silly things. Anyway, we were lucky, we didn't lose an implant and this is the final restoration that was done. But for example, if I have different chains, I, I like to use these different chains. This patient, she lives in Florence, she's Russian, quite young, and this was the situation, evaluation of risk was not, not the best. And she has a fracture in a central incisor and she told me something very, very interesting. She said, I want to replace also the neighbor crown. This was music for my ears because I could avoid any kind of risk. I did a crown with a cantilever. At the moment of extraction, I decided to use uh, a an immediate implant with a customized healing abutment to maintain the shape with uh, mucoderm to give the ideal shape for this case. So this case was very, very predictable thanks to this healing abutment with a sealing of mucoderm with bovine bone. This was the moment of the end of the surgery. This was after one week. You can see how the soft tissue maintained the shape with this cantilever that is in close contact with the, the healing abutment, but without any loading on the healing abutment. After two months, I proceed for the final impressions for both for the implant and for the natural tooth. And this was the day of the delivery. This is after one year after the delivery. Another case more challenging, I could say, where I have to extract the two central incisors. And this was the initial situation. The planning was to extract the two central incisor, place two lateral incisor and do an immediate restoration for the four incisors. This was the day of the surgery, elevating a flap, using a temporary guide for insert the implant guided by the prosthesis and have a sort of template, a sort of, uh, of guide for placing the temporary. Two implants were placed in the lateral incisor region and the temporary bridge was blocked to the temporary abutments. 
After that was placed cerebone, the uh, bovine bone, to maintain the volume on the, of the central incisor and mucoderm to protect with a, a sort of a complete alveolar ridge preservation the two central incisor area and to increase the volume in the buccal side of the lateral incisor. This was the post-op with a temporary. This was after two weeks. This was after two months. And you can see how the shape was moving from one situation and to the other. And finally, uh, the good contour of the soft tissue. This was after 75 days from the beginning to the final contour and the delivery of the final bridge of the central incisors. This is how we started and how we finished without big resorption, big changes in the hard and the soft tissue. And I could say a, an improving of the volume in the lateral incisor thanks to the uh, mucoderm uh, grafting techniques. Of course, we have also very favorable cases like this one. This is what we call in Italy Sunday case is uh, another uh, man, a young man who's living in my area. Uh, you can see here the green stripes are uh, fantastic. We have an ideal situation. And this case is quite old, but you can see we have all the conditions for doing an immediate placement and immediate restoration. The case was studied to see if there was enough bone for immediate placement to reach a high primary stability. We wanted to respect the distance between the implant and the buccal plate, giving space for grafting with bovine bone. The implant is placed exactly three millimeters under the gingival margin, respecting the the rules and you see we can control with microscope from inside the distances the place was filled with bovine bone with cerebone and finalized with a temporary probably in the your question you will ask what is the the orange or yellow fluid this is antibiotics but is not necessary, was part of a study that was not carried on because was not uh, necessary to use antibiotics. This is the final ceramic delivery. At the time, there were no component for very easy screw retain solution. This is after one year, and this is after 30 months. You can see that the situation is still aesthetic and the stability of bone is fantastic. And uh, sometimes what is the problem with our cases is not the hard tissue, it's the soft tissue. This lady, Brazilian lady, she also lives in Florence and uh, she has this failing central incisor and the patient is asking for removing this central incision and doing something uh, fixed. And when I saw the case and evaluate all the problems, I said, okay, here, situation is very difficult. It's very risky. If you want a good aesthetic, we have to work on six teeth, not only in one tooth, because we have different levels, different shapes, space, we have a crown in the neighbor lateral incisor. So I cannot achieve a good aesthetic without moving many things. She said, no, I want just to work on this central incisor. I will accept one compromise result. I said, okay, let's, let's do it if you, if, you, uh, if you don't care so much about aesthetic. Anyway, I decided in this case to place this implant immediately to use bovine bone 
to maintain the buckle volume. And in this case, I cannot use as first choice mucoderm, not because mucoderm has some problems, but because has no possibility to proliferate and has no possibility to improve the keratinization. So I took some connective tissue from the pellet and I inserted, I did an immediate restoration and this is the end of the surgery. You can see during the healing looks not perfect, but we see in time some improvements. This is after one month, this is after two months. I decided then to, to deliver a ceramic crown. You see a bigger volume and you see before and after we had some improving in thickness of the soft tissue and improving in the levels of the middle line of the crown. And after three months, I could say that it's even better. This is after six months when, in my opinion, it's trying to, to, to be better again. And we all know that the soft tissue from the tuberosity or from the pellet, it grow. So uh, as more we wait, as more we will have a good result. The problem we had is that a second problem on the lateral incisor. So again, was necessary to insert an implant at the moment of extraction and the same technique with uh, connective tissue grafting. This is a BLX implant in place, trying to respect the ideal position for the lateral. The stability was very, very high, so it was possible to do an immediate restoration. This is the control from inside. We can see that we have some space between bone and the implant. The implant is one millimeter, even more below the level of bone. And now we want to graph with uh, hard tissue and soft tissue, bovine bone and soft tissue to have some proliferation in time. So what we expect is to have an improvement even in this case. I delivered, even in this case, one temporary crown. This is after one week of healing. Also, in this case, we will wait a longer time for the proliferation of the soft tissue. Last two cases, and this is a Japanese patient, not so young, <clears throat> and uh, she has many red points a high risk case and in this case is in this case i was too much positive i think i had probably the wrong approach i extracted the tooth i placed the implant i did the gbr technique and this was the result you see the healing that looks a concavity and at the moment of uncovering, I used a temporary screw retain, and you can see how bad is the situation of the tissue. I was very, very sad for this initial result because I expected too much from my experience and from my skill. I did too many things at the same time. And this was the moment of delivery where the situation is still not good. And the patient was uh, very, very uh, friendly. She told me, thank you, thank you. You know, she was a real Japanese lady, very polite and very friendly. But if you have such a result 
in a young lady from Sicily, for example, she could kill you with this result. So, the situation was, in my opinion, very bad. The patient probably, she was not able to see very well or she was too kind and she accepted. Fortunately, after three years, the result is a little better. Uh, I could say it's sufficiently good for uh, an old lady, but not sufficiently good for a young patient, in my opinion. So after this bad experience, I decided not to do too many things at the same time. And you see, for example, this patient from Venezuela, she lives in Florence too, like all these people. She's younger. And she's very, very, very interested in aesthetic. You know, South Americans are like Italians. They like aesthetic. They pretend aesthetic. Is the reason they go to a dentist. Uh, in Italy, people come to a dentist for pain or for aesthetics. So you cannot compromise too much with aesthetics. And this patient had a failure center incisor. So, there was an acute process. I decided not to do too many things, just to make the blood clot stabilization with mucoderm and to use a Maryland bridge to stop the situation, not to do too many things, not to place an implant. And you see, also in this case, I have during the healing a concavity, I have no hard tissue grafting in this case. It's a spontaneous healing just blood clot stabilization. But this concavity is not a problem because my implant is not yet there. So every time the implant is not there, you have still many possibility to solve. Hmm? I tell to my students, uh, until you don't place an implant, you are fiancé with the patient. When you place an implant, you are married with this patient. So. Uh, we have to play it at the right moment, not before. So after three months, I did a CBCT and there was enough bone for placing a narrow implant. I don't need big stability because I'm not doing an immediate restoration. I want to improve the volume, not the keratinization, because keratinization is enough. So, as I don't need keratinization, I can use mucoderm in this case. I would be too much invasive to take some connective tissue in this case. So, I improve the volume, I use the customized healing abutment, and this is with a temporary screw retained to guide the shape. And finally, just with soft tissue grafting, with no hard tissue grafting and the narrow implant, I have a good amount of volume, a good volume for finalize the case. And this was after six months, the patient was uh, quite happy. So the messages we can take home. Arturo, I'm sorry, uh, telling you not to make too many questions. <laughs> we we stop completely the questions. But if you want, we can make after the, these conclusions. Uh, yeah, just uh, give the conclusions, yeah. then we can have a little discussion. In implant treatments. Every year I increase the number of grafting procedures. Uh, because I very often have to graft the bone, other times I have to graft the soft tissue, and other times I have to do both things. Second point is that planning, starting from prosthesis to guide the protocols. So uh, we start from the final outcome that we want to achieve. And third point, to know the techniques, to know the biomaterials, and to understand what we can achieve, when is, what is realistic, what is not realistic, and to communicate with the patient all these informations. Because some patients have a lot of expectations, so we have to know in advance the kind of outcome that we have to reach or what is not possible to reach. 
I thank you very much for this fantastic opportunity to be with you. And these are some of the places where I work, my office, the university. Sometimes I bring in Sao Paulo in Brazil many friends since I think 11 or 12 years to make courses with me and with the staff in Sao Paulo. Uh, and for the University of Genova, I travel a lot in all over the world, except now with COVID <laughs> pandemic situation, I don't travel and we do only online courses. Thank you very much. And Arturo, please, I'm uh, more than happy to answer to some questions. Yes, we have millions of questions, Massimo. Thank you very much for your uh, presentations. It was, uh, as usual, amazing. And um, I'm going to choose some of the questions because there are really many. So I think we can have a. And there's a, my, my email address. If, if, in this slide, there's my email address. So if someone has an, a question that I cannot answer, please send me an email and trust me, I will, uh, I will answer to you personally. So. Um, there was the, a few questions about uh, the use of a membrane <clears throat> and in particular how you uh, first of all if you fix it and if you fix the membranes in a GBI for example uh, yeah. how would you proceed? So do you suture it? Do you use pins? Do you leave it without suturing? This was let's say I'm summarizing uh, five or six questions here. Yeah. I think I suggest to you, uh, in my opinion, the most uh, easy way is to use pins. So if it's only for fixing the membrane, for stabilization of membrane, I think pins are the most easy way. Uh, if, on the contrary, you want to obtain a double advantage to stabilize the membrane and passivate the flap, I think this technique is very useful. I show you before. You, you use this kind of suture because at the same time, when you close the stitch, you, you passivate the flap down. So uh, we have a double uh, advantage, stabilization of membrane and passivation of the flap. But if you just need the stabilization of the membrane, pins is my first choice. Okay. Um, uh, still with the JSON membrane, you showed some uh, very cool uh, sinus lift uh, procedures. But there was a question about, instead of doing a sinus lift, if I want to do a vertical augmentation, uh, can I use the JSON membrane, and on a related note, can I do a sausage technique with JSON? Yeah, yeah. JSON, I think, is very, very uh, indicated for sausage technique. I'm sorry, I didn't uh, insert any case of sausage technique. Um, I did it, but I, I have no slides on that. And I think that uh, the kind of resorption, the slow resorption, and the kind of handling of JSON membrane is very good for sausage technique. So vertical augmentation, you all know that is the most challenging application. So uh, we have no evidence of long-term stability of the of the bone that was uh, augmented in a vertical dimension, but uh, Sera bone and Jason membrane, I think is a very uh, good couple of devices for uh, these kind of techniques. Of course, you need a, a very high skill in passivation of flap, uh, in stabilization with pins and mixing with autologous bone. I think this, these factors are mandatory. The same, we, we need to have a good control of mechanic factors. Yeah, I mean, especially if you're doing a big defect, then uh, the autologous bone becomes very crucial for the nice yeah. outcome. Yeah. 
fifty percent with uh, with Cerabon. Still with the <clears throat> with the sinus lift, there was one case you shown with a perforation of the synodarian membrane, and um, the the doctor was asking, I think it's the same case. Uh, why did you use the uh, synthetic bone material inside the sinus? And then you use the bovine bone to protect uh, the surrounding. Yeah, because uh, inside the sinus, I think is the ideal condition for uh, for a synthetic material because regeneration is very predictable. You have a five, you have a box of bone where. A cheap bone is natural, it's, it's spontaneous. You you just need to maintain a volume for some months, but you will get bone for sure. I think after many, many years, sinus lift is one of the most pre predictable procedure. And all the companies of biomaterials use the sinus to show how good is their material, no? <laughs> Even if you place nothing, you, you get bone. <laughs> so... Uh, all the companies, even if you have a very bad biomaterial, you, you put it in sinus and everything here. Of course, no? <laughs> yes. On the contrary, when you want to maintain a volume, you, you need something a little more uh, effective. No. So in the internal side, where it's more predictable, I use the most resorbable biomaterial because... I need to know is a critical defect the, the sinus lift. No, you have seen cases where I have only two millimeters of remaining bone. Of of of, uh, uh, so I have to be sure that what I have in the sinus at the end is real bone, yeah. not something that is uh, a mosaic where 80% of biomaterial and 20% of bone. I want to have 80% of bone and 20% biomaterial. So a most resorbable biomaterial tell me with an X-ray that what is mineralized is bone. On the contrary, in the external side, it's not a critical defect, but I need volume. So I need a long-standing material who impede the invasion of soft tissue. So yeah. the external side on, on the area of the osteotomy, I think bovine bone give me the opportunity to have a shield to block the soft tissue to invade the sinus space. And the same when I want to cover the thread of an implant, bovine bone is more predictable for maintaining the volume because it controls the pressure of the surrounding tissues, is more resistant to the pressure. And there's another very, <clears throat> uh, I think, hard question to answer in a few words, but uh, um, the, one of the doctors asked me, or asked you, um, if you have a preferred protocol to treat perimplantitis. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Um... This is very difficult to answer. How many hours do we have? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> we do another event for this question. I, I can, I think, yeah. First of all, we have no uh, scientific protocols for perimplantitis treatment. Many friends of mine, they simply retrieve the implants. Of course, we retrieve the implants that we didn't place. Yeah? Because if someone else put the implant, we we can... Uh, retrieve the implant, but when it's our implant, sometimes we try to solve the problem. And what became quite clear in my practice is that if ha half of the length of the implant is infected, it's better to retrieve the implant anyway, even if it's my implant. Yeah, even if, if I'm the father and the mother of that implant, I retrieve it because. I need less time to start again instead of trying to treat this implant. Mm. I need more time, more expensive, uh, and it's not predictable. But if I have an initial perimplantitis, what I do sometimes is simply to clean the surface 
that depends on the kind of surface. If it's a smooth surface, it's very easy to clean. But there are some kind of, of surfaces that are almost impossible to clean. So I simply remove the threads, clean everything, polish everything. And my ideal biomaterial for these cases is connective tissue. I also did with mucoderm and was very good. But okay. it doesn't proliferate, it doesn't give you more keratinization. So during perimplantitis, very commonly, you don't have enough keratinization, you don't have the good quality of the soft tissue, so we need connect, so connective tissue. And this uh, connects perfectly with the next question I wanted to ask you. Um, there were a lot of questions about mucoderm and um, um, soft tissue management. And one of the most uh, frequent questions was, where is the limit? Where do you choose mucoderm and when it becomes too challenging to use mucoderm and then you prefer to use the soft tissue, the follow the soft tissue? Yeah, mucoderm is, as you know, Arturo, is uh, one of my favorite biomaterials ever, no? Not only in this company, but in all the market of, of biomaterials. But some colleague... Uh, tried to use and they they were not happy about the results no and then when i asked them but what did you do what what did you want to do to obtain with this material oh i had i had no keratinization at all and i placed the muco there and i didn't obtain keratinization but it's not in the indications so yeah mucoderm the limit of mucoderm in my practice is keratinization if you want stability of the soft tissue, if you want volume, mucoderm is my first choice. As you have seen in the last case, I had enough keratinization. Why should I take some connective tissue from the pellet that the patient will complain for 15 days probably? If keratinization is okay and I just need volume, mucoderm is my first choice. If I have even two, three millimeters of keratinous tissue, mucoderm is still the, my first choice. If I have less than two millimeters of keratinous tissue, I try to think to connective tissue. If I have no keratinous tissue, it is mandatory to use connective tissue or epithelial connective tissue. Mm -hmm. The same if I need. Uh, increase in the height of the soft tissue. Mucoderm is not my choice because it cannot proliferate. Yeah. If, like in the case I showed before, I need to, to bring the tissue down on, the, on the, the crown of the central incisor, I cannot try with mucoderm. has no sense. It's unpredictable. I need to use something who proliferate who is doing something for me. This is the limit. So the limit is clear to me. But many clinicians, they, they expect too much because they are not confident for taking this uh, connective tissue. So they hope that mucoderm solve all the problem because they, they want a, a, a smart solution. No? But there is no smart solution for the soft tissue. You have before you had connective tissue or nothing. Now you have connective tissue, mucoderm, or nothing. And in my practice, con uh, connective tissue is not for all the indications. But the same I want to improve a little. Hmm? So mucoderm, it covers probably the majority of my indications. And uh, since we are talking about this, uh, would it make sense, or this is the way of thinking, uh, one of the questions was about what is the advantage of endogen? So can we imagine endogen giving a little push to mucoderm uh, in this sense? Or why do you use endogen in the study uh, with mucoderm? What is the advantage? Endogen was, I think, one of the best biomaterials in since many many years i think is probably the was, was in, in it's in the market since probably 20 years 
and it works perfectly in the soft tissue healing uh, is very uh, good for video uh, we didn't have indication for implants uh, the main indication was for perio uh, strauman uh, asked me to try this combination with mucoderm and i thought it was probably uh, not sufficiently uh, scientifically based to do. It was expensive. It was a biomaterial not normally used for implants. Uh, but as I started to do for this uh, study, for this paper, we had very good results. And we analyzed the volume up to one year. And uh, the results were stable. So uh, I don't have exactly the idea how much is the importance of m to gain and how much is the importance of mucoderm what i can say is that um, there's a learning curve in managing these biomaterials even if it looks easy in reality is not so easy we need a good stabilization of the biomaterial but m to gain improves the quality of the soft tissue improves a little bit the volume not the keratinization. Hmm. So again, uh, we'll not uh, expect, I think it's not correct to, to say to participants of this Congress that if you do more things, you will obtain more than that. Uh, look at the quality of the soft tissue and it this uh, help you to decide when mucoderm is not enough. Uh, but if you have a sufficiently good soft tissue and you want to improve the volume, for example, mucoderm is very good. With amdogen, in my opinion, is even better. But uh, I'm, I'm, I cannot yet tell you you obtain 50%, 50%, 40%, we don't know. We had yeah. very good results with this combination. So we expect that our paper and following research will tell you what, which, which is the, 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 the weight of every component of this uh, thing. If it's enough, uh, to use bucoderm, if it's enough to the combination, if it's too much, we don't know. Maybe next year when we do a real event uh, in Mexico, maybe you can give a better answer with uh, the new data you have from the article. Yeah. So Marco, I would um, suggest that we proceed to the uh, Botis solution uh, last part of our uh, day. So, um, simply to remind uh, the participants, we ask you to send us some uh, challenging cases that then uh, today Massimo Fosecchi will solve and tomorrow Dr. Cagliazzo. So, we have, uh, I think, time for a couple of cases. So, maybe we can go to the first case and uh, Massimo will comment on this. Next slide, please. Yes, this one. Thank you. Yeah, uh, so there's only this image, so we, we try to work with our fantasy, our imagination. And uh, what I can say for sure is that this shape of the soft tissue, this shape of the crest is not good for the molar. Um, sometimes, you know, a patient come to us just asking for one tooth. He's not asking for mucoderm, for amdogen or for uh, cerebon, yeah? But uh, I have to give the, this patient, if this patient come to my office, I give a mirror in the hand and I show him, look, every tooth you have in your mouth, we have a base that is larger than your tooth. The crest is always larger than a tooth. Uh, in this case, if I put a tooth in this region, you don't have a base that is sufficiently wide. So we need to improve. Probably in this case, we have a good amount of keratinization. If you see, we can even collect some connective tissue from the palate. We can make a roll flap or something. Uh, I would do a CBCT in this case to detect if the bone is enough. If the bone is enough, I would just work with the soft tissue 
taking from the pallet directly. Probably, I think in this case, we have so much soft tissue uh, that we don't need to graft with other biomaterials. But if bone is not enough vertically or horizontally or both, in both direction, we can graft with hard tissue and use the soft tissue of the patient. Second case, this we have uh, we have two failing roots. We have to remove these roots. We we can see that is a maxillary case, so it's quite anterior because probably this region is canine, uh, is lateral incisor and first premolar. These roots, so we are in the anterior region. And we have another problem in this case is that the, the neighbor teeth has been stored. So what we can decide in this case is if it's better to take care about the bone without placing implants, and then at the moment of uncovering to place implants and probably together with connective tissue grafts. In my opinion, as is anterior region, I would just uh, regenerate bone without uh, placing implants or another possibility is just to stabilize the blood clot without bone grafting and go back after six weeks, eight weeks placing implants, improving the heart tissue and uh, covering everything. At the moment of uncovering of the implant we can, we can make if we need a connective tissue graft or if we have enough keratinization, a mucoderm uh, grafting. That is probably the first choice in this case. Um, and um, yeah, should we, should we spend a couple of words here? Maybe as we discussed before, we could also have a general quick discussion yeah. about what to do when uh, uh, there's a, a tooth missing and we have resorption of, uh, of the bone around it. Yeah, in, in posterior area, now, now we don't see very much, so we, we use more our imagination. In posterior mandible, very often we have a severe resorption, uh, especially we have a lack of keratinized tissue. This is very, very common. Uh, we can also see the tongue that is invading the area of teeth. So um, probably we have to make a CBCT to detect how much bone we, we can have. And if we have enough bone for the implant, probably is not yet enough for a first molar in the mandible because the first molar is the bigger tooth in the mouth. So even if we have enough bone for an implant, very often in this region I graph with bovine bone to increase the volume for a first molar that is that can be later uh, good enough for uh, chewing. Of course, the, the lack of keratinized tissue in this area is primarily solved with the connective tissue from the pellet. Only if we have some millimeters of keratinized tissue, we can look for mucoderm as a good solution. So we have to measure many, many things. The bone, the, the kind of molar that we want to make that normally is quite big. So we need an extra volume in bone and sometimes a, a better situation of the soft tissue that is uh, demanding uh, for uh, is we need a connective tissue if we have a lack of keratinization we can need just mucoderm if we have some sufficient keratinization Massimo I uh, let me thank you because it was a brilliant uh, lecture three hours uh, non-stop a lot of questions a lot of interest so I would like to thank you again. Thank you for joining us and uh, as usual, amazing presentation. So uh, as usual, we'll talk again and soon see, see each other at some point.
I would love to come to Florence at some point. Thank you. Thank you very much, Arturo. I also thank all the organization. Uh, everything was fantastic in the organization. And uh, what I would say, when I, I remember two years ago, I ran the New York Marathon. And uh, every time I found people from Mexico, because there was plenty of, of Mexican people, fans all around in the streets, I, I always ran in front of them and say, Viva Mexico! <laughs> <laughs> so they love you, I suppose. <laughs> yeah, I was, a, I was a false Mexican. I was a fake male Mexican because I need more uh, support, you know, because it was so <laughs> <tiny>. okay. <laughs> So I, I, I was actually asking from Mexican people, because Japanese, I don't look so much Japanese, so yeah, no. uh, I tried with the Mexican to be supported. Uh, so again, Viva Mexico, uh, I, I hope to have the opportunity in the future to travel and to, to see you personally. Thank Then you. let's uh, say Viva Mexico. Gra uh, gracias, ma Massimo. Thank you. Y para nosotros, para los participantes, eh, vuelvo al español, uh, simplemente para invitaros a quedarnos con nosotros mañana. Eh, primero, quiero decir gracias por estar con nosotros, tres, tres horas con uh, Máximo Fantásticas. Y mañana empezamos otra vez en el mismo uh, horario, a las 10. Vamos a tener otro uh, guest international star uh, de Italia, doctor Alfonso Cayazzo, juntos con Alejandro García y Ricardo Kern. Mañana la, va a ser un poco diferente, vamos a hablar claramente de regeneración, pero con, uh, uh, digamos, una, un aspecto un poco diferente, sobre todo en particular, uh, el doctor Cayazzo va a hablar de uh, preservación del alvéolo, y nos va a dar una overview de, la, de los métodos, unos que hemos visto hoy también con Máximo. Y eh, Alfonso Cayazzo va a, also a sugerir una nueva técnica y la vemos mañana. Entonces, um, otra vez, uh, gracias por uh, estar aquí y hasta mañana. Aquí tenemos la foto de Cayazzo. Bueno, uh, gracias Máximo y gracias a Alfonso para lo de mañana y hasta mañana.